So welcome everybody. We are starting the workshop uh, panel. It will last two hours. Then we have a lunch break and we will continue with the startup pitching. We are starting with a PwC team from Zurich, right? We, 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 you will talk about the compliance taxes uh, regarding blockchain and ICO. Exactly. Yes. So stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming, ladies and gentlemen, to our ICO workshop. Um, PwC here. My name is Tina Basley, head banking. <laughs> Going on to Jean-Claude Spielmann, head wealth management, Mia Astoria, um, immigration, tax, Silvan Amberg, and banking again, Orkan Sahin. Okay, so let's start with what we believe are the key advantages of ICOs in particular compared to IPOs or other financing means by equity. First of all, it is a very effective way to raise money, meaning that uh, in terms of timing, in, at least in compared to, uh, comparison to an IPO, it is certainly uh, quicker. And, and also then in terms of uh, raising the funds, uh, the moment you launch the coin, it typically takes a, a much shorter time than actually to sell the shares. Apart from that, um, hurdles are removed um, that uh, are currently uh, still in place in, in the equity sphere. And then uh, probably um, a most important point is that with an ICO, you don't dilute the current equity stake in your company and you don't give up control actually over your company. Uh, you're just handing out a token normally, which typically will not be qualified as an equity participation. And so you keep the control over your company when launching tokens and doing an ICO. You can quite quickly put together a reasonable team uh, in order to um, launch your ICO especially if you have already yourself uh, knowledge in the technical field and then coming together with advisors in the field. Uh, apart from that, you can build up an ecosystem using your token within that ecosystem. Uh, the Q word, uh, of course, is in particular uh, utility tokens, which will have some kind of function within your system. Very important point then as well. And then uh, compared to other types of investment, uh, it's, it's a very good marketing tool. That is very apparent um, that ICOs, these successful ones, uh, get a lot of attention. So it is an excellent marketing tool for you as well to go out on the market and then in the future even raise more capital. These are the main advantages we see of an ICO compared to traditional uh, funding. Now, of course, there's always a downside to an upside. What are the downsides we see or the key challenges with regard to ICOs compared to traditional funding? There is um, a certain uncertainty around the world in most jurisdictions how tokens effectively qualified. Uh, in Switzerland, you have certainly heard of the so-called ICO guidelines, which the regulator FINMA just now issued in February, uh, some weeks ago. They have certain guidelines on, on uh, qualification of tokens. We will uh, dive into that more in detail afterwards. Uh, the three types of tokens which the FINMA now has defined to be relevant. Nevertheless, all around the world, there's still a lot of uncertainty and most regulators have not gone that path and not so far as FINMA to actually define the types of tokens with the types of consequences the types of tokens will have from a legal regulatory point of view. So that is one side, a bit of uh, uncertainty on the legal regulatory side. Going on to more technical issues, um, there's a certain risk, of course, that your ICO will be hacked, including the wallets uh, where, where the monies or the funds are be being transferred. So um, certain security issues which have to be taken care of. And then the tax treatment is another issue. We'll have some explanations um, from our colleague Silvan afterwards, how it looks on the Swiss side of taxes. There again, it's a, it's a very new phenomenon also for the tax authorities. 
Um, so not only from the legal regulatory point of view, also for the tax authorities, they have to find a way to somehow deal with this phenomenon and know how, to, how they should effectively tax the different types of tokens and, and the funds coming in in um, the procedure. That's about uh, the key challenges. Going on to the project timeline of an ICO, how we structure it, how it is typically done in the market. So we see down here, it's a typical time frame of four to 12 weeks until it really gets to the effective launching. And then within the launching, we count about uh, four weeks uh, in addition to the preparation phase. What do we start with typically? Uh, business strategy. So you have to know uh, where you're going to, uh, what, where you're coming from uh, as well um, with your uh, token. What do you want to achieve with the token? That is then decisive in um, defining the token economics, uh, the design of the token. That would already be in the second phase, token utility and economy design. In that phase, you will also be drafting the white paper um, for your um, future investors to be a base document. Then we enter into the detail planning. That's also where the lawyers come in, other types of advisors. Um, typically also, at least in Switzerland, uh, the typical uh, procedure is that once you have designed your token economics, you take them and you actually go to the regulator who is called FINMA and you get a ruling on the type of your token, meaning that the regulator will then answer to you whether this token is effectively under any kind of regulation in Switzerland or not. So that is quite unique uh, looking around the world. There are not too many regulators out, out there who can offer you a real ruling also for tokens which you then can rely upon, at least based on the facts as you have handed them in to the regulator FINMA. So this is a very important part here in Switzerland. Plus, you will normally also want to reach out to the tax authorities and having their rulings on how they will be uh, treating your uh, ICO as well, so that there are no surprises on uh, that side either. Then you go on to the sales execution. You have the launch of your website, obviously also the technical side in then effectively deploying um, the token and bringing it to the market. You also have to be aware of your anti-money laundering requirements depending on the type of token you're going to issue and have that in place so that to the extent it's required by law, and also now that it's a more or less a market standard, that you are effectively in a position to be able to identify your investors to the extent necessary. And then effectively launching your co token, of course, together with all of the needed sales documentation and uh, succession documents which the investor will adhere and um, accept during um, the launch of your token. Now let's get into a bit more of detail how tokens are viewed and structured here in Switzerland, what types of regulatory requirements and areas can be relevant for your token. We have, as a first instance, collective investment schemes law. This becomes relevant if you are actively um, raising funds which are then being uninvested um, by, by a third party and uh, the proceeds are then uh, paid back to your token holders. Now this is not the usual case. Usually <coughs> tokens, at least so far we have seen, uh, do not qualify as collective investment schemes. Nevertheless, you have to be aware of that area as well. Going on to AML, um, anti-money laundering uh, issues, in Switzerland, these in particular are of importance if you are issuing a so-called payment token or if you are effectively involved in payment transfers within uh, your ICO. We will see a bit further down what that means uh, specifically. Going on to deposits. So potentially by the fact that you are accepting 
funds within your ICO, this potentially at least makes you a bank. Why? Because the definition of bank, at least in Switzerland, is that you are accepting funds from the public. Now, effectively, you are doing that. However, most of the tokens, there will not be a repayment obligation, which is the second part of the definition which is relevant for a banking deposit. Obviously, if you deposit something, you want to have it back afterwards. If there's no agreement that the investor will actually get back its funds, then it should normally not be deemed a deposit in banking terms and you're out of the banking sphere, luckily. Going on to security. Now, this is more or less the, the most uh, hot uh, notion and topic within the ICO launch phase. Uh, obviously, the discussion is a bit influenced by the US um, term of security and consequences um, uh, connected to the term security. In Switzerland, you have to know that the mere fact that something is deemed a security does not automatically get you into issues. You have to go beyond that. You have to look at the token economics and uh, define or analyze whether your token effectively is similar to an equity participation, a bond participation, or it might even be a derivative. In the first two instances where it's like an equity or a bond, then this gets you into prospectus requirements from a Swiss perspective. However, again, not too burdensome. Uh, quite straightforward what needs to be included in a Swiss type of prospectus. Important to know, in Switzerland there's no obligation to register such prospectus up to now. This will change probably in 2020, but at the moment you just draw up your prospectus. This does not have to be reviewed by any type of authority and you don't have to register your security either. So quite straightforward process. Plus, by the mere fact that you are issuing a security, typically does not get you into the area of securities dealing. Unless you are issuing a derivative, then you are deemed to be a derivative house, and as such, you require a license as a securities dealer. So, a uh, base message, it is most burdensome in Switzerland if you are effectively um, launching a token which qualifies as a derivative. Apart from that, the issues also connected with securities are quite straightforward and can be handled quite easily. This in terms of an overview of the areas of law which are relevant to you when launching an ICO in Switzerland. Now, I will hand on to my colleague Jean-Claude. He will give you more insight on the, typical, on the types of tokens the FINMA has defined. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Actually, uh, FINMA, as you know, has issued uh, uh, guidance on the token qualifications about three weeks ago. And FINMA has defined three types of tokens. You see it here, uh, you have these payment tokens, then the utility tokens, and as the third category, the asset tokens. Actually, there is a numerous clauses, uh, so to say, of tokens. So these three token types are conclusive. However, uh, there is a possibility that a token has a hybrid stru uh, structure so that more different aspects of the token can be uh, part of these, uh, these definitions. So then you have a hybrid token, and that means that you have to comply with the requirements that are uh, applicable for one type of these tokens. Then there is also the possibility that a token may be reclassified during the life cycle. So maybe in the beginning, the token is an asset token, and then eventually the token becomes a payment token, for example. So what does this mean? Why is it so important, this classification? Because the classification triggers the, the requirements under the regulatory regime in Switzerland. 
So let's go to the payment tokens. What is a payment token? Uh, a payment token is some sort of means of payment, so you can pay goods and services with the token. Uh, it's also referred to as <coughs> cryptocurrencies. So the, the, it's a currency token or a payment token. What does this mean from a regulatory perspective? Active Finma says that a currency or payment token is not a security. Uh, I think this is an important statement. However, Finma also says that this might be changed in the future, so that, that this view might change depending on the, the developments uh, in, in, in the, the regulatory sphere in Switzerland and also uh, worldwide. From an AML perspective, uh, the issuing of such token brings you in the, in the sphere of the uh, application of the anti-money laundering rules of Switzerland. Uh, if you are issuing such tokens within an ICO, you have to comply to AML, the AML regulation, and this also means you have either to register with uh, ASRO, so a self-regulatory organization for AML purposes, or there is also the possibility to uh, be licensed with FINMA. However, uh, usually we see that uh, you go with an ASRO, it's uh, somehow a bit easier and, and uh, I think also quicker to, to, to have uh, this registration. Uh, it means that you have to go through certain KYC to uh, certain due diligence uh, requirements when uh, selling your tokens to the buyer of such a token. Examples for uh, such tokens are, of course, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. Then the utility tokens. From a regulatory perspective, these are, are the, most, is the most favorable classification. As you see, these tokens, according to the classification of FINMA, if they are pure utility tokens, they do not qualify as a security, and they also do not trigger anti-money laundering uh, requirements. So, if you have really a pure utility token, and this has to be assessed carefully because it, it can be that it is a hybrid token, so uh, you have also elements of a, let's say, a uh, payment token or an asset token, then you will not be fully out of the regulation. But if you have a pure uh, utility token, then no of these two areas are applicable, so no security and no AML requirements. Uh, but what is a utility token? A utility token uh, provides you access to, to a digital service or uh, application service, so uh, it's quite a narrow definition of the utility token. And then we have a third, the third uh, category of tokens. These are the asset tokens. Uh, asset tokens represent, as you see, assets such as a debt or equity claim against the issuer. Uh, with an asset token, you can share proceeds, uh, future earnings of a company. Uh, and as this definition is quite broad yeah, of the asset token, we think that in practice, if the token does not qualify as a, uh, as a, uti ut uh, as a utility token or a payment token, then you will fall in the third category uh, as an asset, the token will fall in the category of asset tokens, which means that this will be the residual uh, category of tokens, and so a lot of tokens will fall in this category. What does it mean from a regulatory perspective? Uh, such asset tokens do qualify as security. This uh, 
as we heard from Tina, does not trigger directly uh, any requirements. However, you have to be careful if you then uh, meet any of the, the additional requirements that can be applicable for, uh, for uh, securities. With regard to AML, there uh, strictly are out of uh, the regulation. So issuing asset tokens does not require from you that you do KYC uh, with your clients. We, actually, we see in the market that uh, a lot of clients do the AML and KYC anyway. So we're on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, yeah, on a basis just uh, if, if it is because it's important to do it. Uh, but you are not required to do it. Actually, so I can hand over to my colleague, which uh, gives you some insights about the tax consequences of this token qualification. Thank you, Jean-Claude. So I don't want to go into all the technical details of the tax treatment, but I want to show you, and I prepared this one slide, uh, what are the main kind of considerations when planning an ICO, um, where we see kind of the most struggle with our clients. So um, here we have the ICO company. Uh, obviously, one of the first topics that the people are asking is how, are, um, our in, how is our income going to be classified? We'll have to pay taxes up front. Um, here, I think for most of the kind of incoming funds, there is some solution to defer the taxation in Switzerland. We're going to talk a bit more on, on the next slide about the, the treatment of, of money raised in ICU depending on the token's nature. Um, but that's definitely one of the first topics you want to know. The second question related to it is, and it's also almost the same importance, is what is the VAT treatment? Because depending on what kind of token you're issuing, your services could either be subject to VAT or they could be exempt. And usually it sounds more, it, it would sound better to have an exempt token, but as most of your investors will be sitting outside of Switzerland, being subject to VAT might not actually cost you a lot because you would only be, have to pay VAT if you're actually selling it to a Swiss investor, but if you're selling it abroad, you wouldn't even have to pay VAT. However, what's important is if all your income that you're doing in the Swiss company is exempt services, you might not get VAT recovery on your input services. And what most of the ICO companies do, they don't develop the product in Switzerland, but they actually um, have it programmed or developed in a foreign country. So what they have to do on all these bills that they have to pay from Switzerland, they have to reverse charge VAT of 8%, of 7.7 .7 now since 2018. Um, but then this, this reverse charge VAT, the question is, can you actually reclaim it? And if all your income is exempt, then you might have problems to get the VAT back. So that's a very important point is in the ICO, not just to think about the income tax consequence of the ICO, which is usually less the problem. Um, it's, it's really also out the VAT. Um, then once this, this money is coming in, usually there is some kind of a founder's remuneration. So the founders usually spend quite some money. Uh, there's maybe some seed investors that have to help to develop the product. Obviously, somehow you need to transfer this assets to the company. And then the question is, how can I structure this in a way that it's not too bad from a tax perspective? And that obviously depends a bit where your founders are sitting. But there's definitely also a consideration. Maybe before you do the ICO, think about how do I, will I do the exit of, of the founders and how will I actually manage it and not only think about this once you already raised the money. Um, a very important um, aspect from a tax perspective, which I believe that often got forgotten in the past, if you do um, remuneration, like employee participation in tokens, you have to think about what would be the tax treatment. And the tax authorities in Switzerland um, have, until now, had quite a um, conservative practice. What they're saying is that if you get tokens in any kind of way, whether you get it for free or whether you actually have to pay for it, they would look at this as a, a um, employee participation which is not based on shares. Because they say, well, it's not a share, what you get, it's something else. So it needs to be a uh, other type of employee participation and how the law is phrased at the moment is these type of participations are only taxed once you realize the money, which kind of makes sense that you only pay tax when you get the money. However, in case of these tokens, you might not even think about, but when you ho hold these tokens for a couple of years and you sell them later on, this will trigger then your bonus income tax consequence. So you have to pay full amount of income tax, no capital gains, tax-free capital gains, as you would otherwise have in Switzerland. And the company retrospectively needs to pay social security on these amounts. 
How can you even find out how much money your employees, maybe they're not even employed anymore with your company, how can you find out? And it's probably, you don't like to have a, a lot of uh, social security contributions five years down the road when your company is very successful. So that's something, the structuring of employee participation, where it's really important to carefully look at it and find a, a better structure than just like giving out tokens for free. Um, another point is when you transfer these IPs or whatever it is to Switzerland, um, for companies that are operating mostly outside of Switzerland, they, they're developing outside of Switzerland, usually it's not sufficient just to pay an amount of money for that development or for that IP to be transferred, but you actually need to put in place mechanisms to control that IP in Switzerland. So you need to have the proper contracts in place, you need to have the proper infrastructure in Switzerland to ring fence this IP. Because other countries, once this company is growing bigger, other, companies w uh, other countries will try to tax this IP as well. So unless you can actually prove it really, that you have the central control over this IP in Switzerland, it doesn't matter whether you have a patent or registered it or whether you have paid for it. If there's no substance in Switzerland, it's really just a box where you put, took, took on money from the ICO, this IP might not be defendable from the country where actually your developers sit, where your founders sit. These, these countries will try to attack it and they will try to tax your profits. So that's also an important consideration that everything is planned properly on the IP side. Um, I think these are probably the kind of the most important topics that we see where it's important not just to see the income tax but really also all these other aspects. And now let's have a look at the treatment of the ICO itself from a tax perspective. What different type of taxes do we have and how is it different depending on the nature of the tokens? So. Um, this, this, the tax rules, they kind of are linked to the regulatory treatment, but it's not in all cases the same treatment. So um, I would say the most important taxes, the, the, the four most important taxes, I have listed them here. As I already said, the income tax of the ICO, uh, that's definitely the, the one that you need to kind of solve because if you raise 20 millions and you have to pay 15% tax on, on this 20 million, that would not be nice. Uh, the way it works usually in Switzerland is if you have an, in, an equity or a debt type of token, you would just book a liability on your liability side as you would do with share capital. That's quite easy. But most tokens, as we know, they, are not, they don't give um, any kind of promise to give money back, but they're rather a payment or a utility token. And there you don't have this direct claim that you can put in your books. Um, the way we usually can structure it, because Swiss accounting rules are quite flexible, that we book a corresponding provision because you're kind of obligated to use the funds for a special purpose. So you cannot just take the money out and take it out and, and walk away. You actually promised in your term sheet or your white paper to use the funds for a very specific purpose. So what you can do is to book a corresponding liability in your books to offset your income from the ICO that leaves you with zero profit. Um, the question gets a bit more complicated. For example, you're taking Ether or Bitcoin and um, these maybe hopefully go up in value and one year later you have five millions more in your books. So how, what does that mean for your liability? Do you actually now have to spend these five million on the development of the project or not? If you have a clear obligation to spend it, you might argue that if you increase your liability, you can further defer the tax treatment, uh, the taxation of this income. But if you cannot show that because your term sheet is maybe not properly defined, you might end up with the taxation of these capital gains once you convert it into fiat. So that's important when doing the ICO that you think about all these scenarios that could leave you with a profit in your company to exactly define who is actually the beneficiary of these profits. Is it the company? Is it the token holders? Um, and if you clarify that, you will also then be able to get a appropriate tax treatment for that. Um, VAT I've already mentioned, it's important to look at these tokens uh, what they are, and then decide whether they're taxable or not. So this also means if they're taxable, you have to register for VAT. You don't necessarily have to pay it because your investors are not sitting in Switzerland. However, how do you prove that? You have to supporting, prepare supporting documents for this. But here you cannot just follow exactly the regulatory treatment. I mean, there is kind of a assumption that if you have an asset token or if it's a payment token that this would be then also qualified for VAT purpose as exempt financial services. However, it's not 100% sure that the tax, the VAT authorities have usually their own opinion. Um, it gets a bit more complicated in the utility token uh, space. So 
quite often what the utility tokens could be is that you say, okay, I get in money and I, I develop a software. So what I'm actually selling is a software. And then it's a taxable service. The selling software is a taxable service. However, if the main purpose of getting this token out is not the development of the, pro of the software, but it's rather the financing of the software, then we will end up again in a tax exempt financial service. So here it gets quite tricky and I think there is no way to get this like really straighted out until you do a tax ruling with the VAT authorities. And that's important to know because that kind of drives your whole VAT profile. Another nasty topic, not necessarily for the ICO issuer, but rather for everyone in Switzerland dealing afterwards with your tokens is the question of the stamp duty. Um, we have two stamp duties in Switzerland. One is stamp duty on equity issuance, a 1% stamp duty that you have when you raise share capital. Here, I would say the scope is rather narrow. So not every asset token would be subject to the stamp duty, but only if it's really a type of an equity. So if you're issuing equity on the blockchain, um, then you would have to pay this. However, I, I have not seen really many cases that would fall into the category. The second one where the tax authorities are a bit broader in their assumption is the um, securities transfer tax. That's the tax that usually Swiss people, Swiss banks are paying when they trade with shares or bonds. And here the tax authorities say that they kind of interpret it quite broadly. And many type of tokens that give you a financial payment out of the token, they would look at this as taxable securities because they say it's kind of share-like, um, which I'm not so sure if that's going to turn out to be the final solution in the end because it's, um, you could still argue it's more like a derivative. But I think at the moment, I would be rather careful with any type of token that pays out money that could be qualified as securities. And that's very important if you operate, for example, a crypto exchange in Switzerland. If you trade with these type of tokens, even if you have foreign investors, you would always be required to divide it, the tax. And I think we're going to see much more, many more cases because it's a, it's a booming market now to start trading not only in the four major cryptocurrencies, but really also in alt, altcoins. And there, I think there is a couple of them amongst them that would qualify for sec, uh, securities transfer tax. So that's not necessarily for the ICO, but really important for subsequent trading afterwards. Um, Swiss withholding tax is 35%, so it's rather high. Um, we have withholding tax on dividends on collective financing, uh, on, sorry, on interest of collective financing, and we have withholding tax on dividends. We don't have withholding tax on royalties or any other kind of service payments like other countries have. Um, so you always have to analyze, is my token paying anything? If it's not paying, you usually wouldn't have a problem. However, if it's paying anything, you would have to analyze, could this be qualified as an interest? Is it like really like a debt, what I issued? Or could it be qualified as a dividend? And here again, I think the scope is a bit more narrow than with the securities transfer tax. So um, there is probably many type of payments that are not based on the kind of the um, profit of the company, but rather this kind of a royalty or something that is dependent on your turnover or any other kind of amount, which is not directly linked to the equity, uh, the, 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 the profits and the reserves of your company, which then should not be subject to withholding tax. But definitely, I would say as soon as your token is supposed to pay something, have a look at this. Also, if you try to circumvent this by destroying tokens, I mean, at the moment, we see many cases where people say, well, we're not going to actually pay out something. We rather buy tokens back and then we just destroy them, and that kind of leads us with the same result. So people will get capital gains. However, when in Switzerland you buy back shares and you destroy them, it's going to be treated as a liquidation or partial liquidation, which is also subject to the same tax treatment than if you pay out dividends or if you liquidate a company. So destroying tokens doesn't necessarily get you out of the withholding tax, even though you don't pay out money. So uh, all these type of tokens that kind of give something back to the shareholders, I think it would be worthwhile to have a look at withholding tax as well. So that's from, from the tech side. Happy to answer questions later or in the break. Exactly. Uh, that's the word. We're here now for a couple of more minutes. Please stay on stage and media as well um, to answer questions you might have in the area of ICOs for Switzerland. Uh, legal regulatory, we have uh, Mia here from immigration and obviously also tax. So please feel free. First question. Yes, please. No problem. I'm Marta from Edu, based in Puerto Ventura. Very nice. <laughs>
special type situation in the Canary Islands. Uh, we're looking now really to start uh, to buy a company here. Yep. But I saw in exactly this moment the same with Lulu Cinema as I mentioned. Yep. And you pretty much uh, an afterthought to that. Yes, that, that, that's true. Uh, Jean-Claude will maybe say something as well to that. It's true that um, given uh, that, that you have a kind of a mixture, if I understand it correctly, that more or less gets you automatically in the asset basket because this is the biggest basket. I mean, to be a payment token, you clearly have to just focus on the payment uh, function, which is not the case. To be a utility token, you clearly have to focus on the utility function within your system. If that's not the case, then it's really just the asset token uh, remaining. And there we're in the area of at least security. Then one has to look at the details. Does it qualify effect eventually as a equity, equity participation, debt, um, or even something else? So, so yes, um, you are now in the most tricky basket. And, <laughs> and that, that, yeah, that you definitely have to look at the details then for that. What, what you already analyzed yourself. Yeah, yeah, match there. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yes, uh, okay, maybe you can say something on the tax side afterwards. No, that the, the valuation is, is a key point and extremely, extremely difficult because um, all the traditional methods, they kind of don't work. So that, that's, that's absolutely the case. Um, <laughs> Fred, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, we, we have uh, people working on that, obviously also in PwC, but even for the experts, it's, it's a really, really difficult task. And each case has to be obviously looked at very individually. And, and even for each case, you have to find your, your own um, instruments actually for the valuation. Yeah, that, that's an extremely difficult question. Yeah. And there are some must add points which we can hear. For, for the valuation? Uh, now, do you, for, from the tax valuation side? No. It's the same as for, for all the topics, it should be at arm's length. Uh, and if, if it's not, then you might end up with kind of hidden profit distributions that you have to pay with holding tax on it. Um, but that's, I mean, the tax authorities have not looked at valuation models for ICO yet. They would rely, they usually in Switzerland, we don't, we don't have special rules for taxation. They rely on standard kind of industry practice. As soon as you can demonstrate something reasonable, I think it's mo much more difficult to find something that is kind of acceptable for the market. But once it's acceptable for the market, I think the tax authorities will follow that, unless it's kind of you, you would really make it in an abusive way. I don't see the, the problem on the tax side here. So, any more questions? Yes, please, in the back. So, you mentioned this transformation possibility of yep. tokens and the ability to pay them for past tokens potentially. Yeah. Uh, I believe that those countries are also going to wait for this transformation because they have a very positive year yep. to realize the amount of transfer uh, needs to pay them for compared to the value of the Yes. Value. Yes, very good question. So, um, it's effectively, <coughs> we have two phases exactly, which are relevant. The first phase, of course, is the launch. Uh, and that is at least one of the most important phases in terms of how does it treat, uh, how, what effects does it um, show for the issuer. So in the moment um, of issuance, you have to know whether it's an equity asset or payment token. And then this kind of circle we saw, in which areas does it get you or does it not get you in terms of an issuer too. Uh, that's the first point. Point. Then, if eventually a payment token, for instance, uh, would evolve, which is more unlikely, but would evolve to be an asset uh, token, 
then this would get you into the security. I mean, the most dangerous is that you would that the token upfront would not qualify as a security, which is most probably the case if it's um, a utility token, which then turns into kind of an asset token, exactly. And so that has no effect on the issuer anymore, but it has an effect on the trading of the token. Because once you have a security and you trade the security, this has two points which can follow. On the one side, the people trading in this token might be deemed a securities trader, depending on the circumstances, thresholds and so on. And then second point is the type of platform where these tokens are being traded on. Um, it will be quite possible that the trading platform will need a license itself once the tokens become a security and are not just merely payment tokens anymore or utility tokens. So yes, these are the two things we have to uh, differentiate. The, the issuing phase where we have the issue, what is the token effectively? And then second, in the trading phase, is it a security or not? That is then the main question. Other types of questions like whether it's a uh, banking law relevant or not, these are then uh, over, but it's then relevant whether it's a security or not. Is, Tax? There's also another aspect where quite often when you have these tokens that would evolve, you would probably already incorporate in the beginning these features that you say, okay, maybe in the beginning we're going to do this and once this milestone is reached, it's going to have an additional functionality. And I mean, if you already issue uh, to the token holders in the knowledge that it's in the, in the, in the end it's going to be a security, you might already have to face kind of the consequent, the regulatory consequences when you're issuing. And that's, that's important to know. I mean, I would say it's probably rather unlikely that surprisingly after five years you change your plans completely it's more likely that you have a, a phased approach and then you cannot just say okay at the moment i'm a pure payment so i don't have to do anything but you know already now that in three years it's going to convert into a security yeah, i think it's, it's important that you differentiate here the the transformation of the token or is it already in the beginning a hybrid token and if if it qualifies already in the beginning as a hybrid token you have to, to, to comply with all the requirements that are applicable to both of the, the types of tokens. So I, in order to be cautious, I would rather qualify it as a hybrid token than to go the more aggressive way to say it's in the beginning a utility token and it becomes an asset token uh, in a second instance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. So looking forward to discuss the, during the break the, your input and big picture. Uh, I'm also interested.